Okay, well, no prizes for guessing what the sermon topic is uh, today, I suppose. Last time, as I've also said already, it was the Lamb of God. And uh, we used the letter S uh, back then. Hopefully, some of you may be able to remember some of the things that we saw. But we saw that he was the spotless, submissive, substitutionary, saving sacrifice. And all of that is bound up in that name. But you might remember when we we got towards the end of that message, I, I asked the question, so does that mean that he is safe? Because we all tend to think of lambs as being cute and cuddly and, uh, you know, we just, uh, well, won't speak for the men here, but uh, from what I hear the ladies uh, saying, when they get close to a cute and cuddly lamb, they just want to throw their arms around it and give it a big hug and um, get quite emotional. We men, especially we British men, um, don't go in for that kind of stuff. Not openly anyway, but inwardly we sort of think, yeah, they actually are kind of cute. So is, is that... Is that Jesus? Certainly, that's the Jesus that is predominantly declared in the church today. And it's certainly not wrong. Um, But what I want us to see this morning is that that is very definitely an aspect of Jesus, but it is one aspect. Remember, we're looking at the names given to him because each of them is going to shine a light on his character uh, and, and, and highlight something else, something more about him. You could never uh, just have one name. You could never do justice to such a, a perfect and, and beautiful being as he is if he only had one name. So he has many. So is he safe? Because he's the Lamb of God, is he safe? Well, let's find out, and we're going to look at this name, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, to help us understand that. And he's given this name, or he's called by this name, uh, in our text, which is in Revelation 5 and verse 5. And we'll go into the context a little bit more deeply as the message progresses. Uh, But John is caught up into heaven, and uh, he's in the midst of uh, a very glorious and remarkable vision here. And this is what he says just in this one verse. One of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah. It turns out that actually lions were quite uh, common in uh, in the land of Palestine um, back in those days. Not the larger African ones, apparently, a smaller one that they call an Asiatic lion. Uh, It's not there anymore. But it's not unusual uh, in Scripture to come across accounts of of lions. And because of that familiarity, you'll find lions and mentions of lions woven throughout Scripture. And we can start to get an idea of the kind of things that they were known for, the character Um, that was attributed to lions. For example, uh, they were known to be strong. Uh, Judges 14 and verse 18. uh, The story of, you remember, Samson and his his riddle, and when they managed to figure out what the answer to the riddle was, they come to him and they say, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? Now, we don't want to get into the riddle and all that stuff, but... That is a rhetorical question. From their perspective, what was stronger than a lion? Nothing. They couldn't conceive of anything more powerful, stronger. 
and uh, you'll read accounts of, of some of the great men, uh, some of David's mighty men, I think, and even David himself. One of them goes down into a pit on a snowy day and he kills a lion. And that's really quite an achievement. So they're strong. Um, they're courageous as well. 2 Samuel 17 verse 10. Even the one who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will completely lose heart. Again, let's not think about the context, but the understanding. The understanding is that a lion has a valiant and a courageous heart. Um, the Brits among us, or those who've studied a little bit of history, will know that the, the King Richard I was called Coeur de Lion, which in French is uh, it's lion heart. Richard the lion heart. And, and, so, and he was a mighty warrior, apparently. That's how he got the name. Um, he didn't sort of leaf through some book of great names for kings to be called in the 12th century and say, oh, this sounds good. I think I'll have this one. Uh, he was a great warrior king. And, and they looked at him and they said, he's got a heart of a lion. He's courageous. Um, lions are also fearless, Isaiah 31, 4. Thus says the Lord to me, as the lion or the young lion growls over his prey against which a band of shepherds is called out, and he will not be terrified at their voice nor disturbed at their noise, so will the Lord of hosts come down to wage war on Mount Zion and on its hill. So here's the Lord likening himself to a lion, but showing how fearless a lion could be. You could have a whole band of shepherds trying to come and uh, presumably save part of a flock, and the lion just looks at them and is unafraid. Bring it on. Uh, I'm quite happy where I am, and I've got the measure of you, and I'm not going to be afraid, no matter how many and what you bring against me. Um, also, lions were thought to be wrathful and terrifying. Proverbs 19, 12. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. Uh, kings in those days weren't so much the figureheads that they often are today. Um, they wielded absolute power, even as recently as Henry VIII. You knew for sure that if he happened to say one day, off with his head, um, that you're probably your life expectancy had just been significantly reduced. Um, kings wielded absolute power within their bounds, as it were, within their kingdoms and their parameters. They had life and death in their hands. And if they got angry with you, that was not a good place to be. It was terrifying to witness. And it reminded people of what it's like to be in front of a lion that roars full strength and there are no bars and cages or anything in the way. All you can see is that this lion's getting pretty riled up at you. That's not a good place to be. So lions are strong, courageous, fearless, wrathful, and terrifying. And it's not surprising, given those kind of characteristics, that royalty and being a lion are very often kind of linked in Scripture because you want a king, uh, I hope, who is strong. You don't want a weakling on the throne. You don't want a pushover. Some other countries coming up to war. You don't want a, a king who goes and shuts himself in the bedroom and is trembling like crazy. You need a king who is strong. You need a king who is courageous who's going to lead out the army and uh, 
and do battle. A king that you can follow. Not a king where you have to sort of look around. You know, like, like Saul when he was, um, I think he was about to be anointed king or something. They couldn't find him and he'd gone away and hidden himself. Um, he was a little bit transformed after that. But you don't want a king who nine times out of ten or worse is off hiding in a, a, a garden shed or something when you're about to put your life on the line for a battle. You want one who's courageous. You want one who's fearless. When the odds look to be against you, you want one who is steady and can look that in the face and still lead and not be afraid. I think we probably want a king who's wrathful and terrifying as well, and, and not a, a, can I say a wimp? Does that translate? Um, not a ball of fluff. You know, powder puff king doesn't really cut it, does it? Um, you want a king if he's just. Uh, the horrible thing is when a king is tyrannical and, and fickle, you know, this, saying this thing one moment and that thing another, and has the power um, and wields it. You don't want a king like that. But if a king is just and fair, then being wrathful against sin and, uh, and just and terrifying against the wicked and stamping out those things in the kingdom, I think is something we would all look for in a king. So kings are often linked to lions because of these kind of shared characteristics. Well, now here's Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. His name underlines for us, and we'll see this as we work through the message, that he is king. And that's why he's called lion, and he has many of the characteristics of the lion, all of these characteristics here and, and others that we haven't mentioned. He is strong. No one stronger. He is courageous, fearless, and he is wrathful and terrifying in some ways. And uh, this verse in Revelation 5.5 5, tells us that he is um, in the royal line of the tribe of Judah. He's, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also the root of David. So he's come down through that royal line that God brought to pass uh, in the tribe of Judah. So that's by way of background. When you think of the lion, I mean, this is what people looking at it that, who had some familiarity with lions. You know, sometimes if you live in the mountains here or the foothills even, you, you get a little bit of trouble from bears. Well, probably back in those days, what was rummaging around in the trash cans in their backyard wasn't a bear, could have been a lion. Okay? You don't want that because they tend to be very strong, very courageous, fearless, wrathful, and terrifying. Jesus has those characteristics, and that's why he's called the lion. He is the king. And uh, what I want to see this morning are three things um, about him connected with this name. And uh, these all begin with the letter V. Uh, the first is that he is the vouchsafed king. Now, I'm not worried that that may sound a little contrived because it might actually stick in your minds. It's not a word that, uh, that we use very much these days, but it means promised. If I vouchsafe something to you, I am making you a promise. So Jesus is the vouchsafed king. He is the victorious king. And he is the vengeful king. He is a king of vengeance. So first then, he is the vouchsafed king. What we've looked at in, in Revelation 5.5 5 refers back into the book of Genesis when Jacob, who's about to leave this world, calls his sons around him 
and he pronounces a blessing upon them. And in Genesis 49, verses 9 and 10, he comes to Judah. And this is what he says. Judah is a lion's whelp, young lion. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And that's where we get the lion of the tribe of Judah from. And I want you to notice that there is no doubt that he is king. Okay, because starting from this moment, Jacob is saying there is going to be royalty in the tribe of Judah. The scepter is not going to depart from that tribe until uh, Shiloh comes, and you can certainly understand that, I believe, until he comes to whom that scepter belongs. And the ruler's staff is not going to be taken away from between the feet of Judah. And the people will bow in obedience to this one who is to come. And so it was that David came in the tribe of Judah and was installed as king. And all of his descendants in the male line, the firstborn most often, were kings because the scepter was not going to depart until the king came to whom all these other kings were just pointing forward. Jesus would come. So this is the one that we see in Revelation 5 and verse 5. The lion of the tribe of Judah, promised by God through Jacob back in the book of Genesis, many, many, many years before. He was promised. And here he is in Revelation. He's come. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He is here. He is king. And we need to recognize that about him. Now, the fact that he is a promised king and God clearly kept that promise tells us that, as if we needed a reminder, but it probably doesn't hurt, God keeps his promises. There isn't a promise that he has made in his word that will ever fall to the ground. Can't happen. Won't happen. They are absolutely rock solid promises, just like this one. So, as we learn to bring promises to God in our prayers, as, as Spurgeon was encouraging us to do on Wednesday night, what a, what a powerful tool that is. I, I've said this on a Wednesday night meeting. Those of you who are parents here will know this. If you abs sort of absent-mindedly or, or somewhat um, in an unguarded moment make a promise to your child, you may forget all about it. They won't. And at the appropriate moment, they will come to you and they'll say, Dad or Mom, can we do this, please? And you go, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. But you promised. And then you think, oh, yeah. I guess I did. And you're sunk, aren't you? I expect everybody's been through that little drama. Well, let's think about what it's like coming to God in prayer. Lord, you promised and you wrote it down. And I know that this isn't catching you out or causing you any embarrassment. You've given me this promise so that I can do this. On the basis of the promise you have given in your word, Lord, hear us. 
do this for us. He keeps his promises. And, and the other thing to note here is a wonderful thing. Jesus is king. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He has the scepter. In his hand, he has the ruler's staff between his feet. He is in glory now, installed as king. Your king. If you have put your trust in him, your king, eternal, glorious, in heaven, now, for you, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But let's move on to our second one. He is the vouchsafed king, the promised king. He is the victorious king, because all of this wouldn't really matter uh, if he was a king who was so defeated and so powerless that, that, that he could do nothing. Let's head back to Revelation 5 and, and look at the first four verses. Just before we get to verse 5, where the lion is, is mentioned. And as I, as I said, John's caught up into heaven. He's having these remarkable visions. Um, and we know that uh, Jesus is going to be identified here as the king that Jacob foresaw. But there's a problem. At least it looks like there's a problem. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look inside. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. I think most people believe that this, this scroll represents the purposes of God and the seals as they're described in the following chapters in the book. Each one of them is accompanied by a judgment being poured out on the enemies of God. So the whole picture is the purposes of God and particularly his purposes of justice and vengeance against his enemies are held up because there's no one worthy enough to open up those seals and to make the purposes of God advance. It's a kind of heart-stopping moment. Does that mean that all the wicked are going to get away with it? Does that mean that, that the justice of God can't fall upon those who have so deserved it? And then you have this relief. It doesn't mean that at all. Because there is one who is worthy to open those seals. There is one who is worthy uh, to carry forward the purposes of God and to mete out justice to his enemies. And who is that one? Revelation 5.5, 5, one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Remember last week it was, Behold the Lamb. Well, here it is. Behold, the lion, the one that Jacob foretold, the one that is in the tribe of Judah, that is in the line of David. He has done something to be worthy to open up that scroll. He's overcome, it says, so as to open the book and its seals. Well, how did you do that? Because if you mentally run through your, you know, you, you have a mental idea of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, run through there. 
Did you see in the Lord Jesus Christ a lion? Did you look through those passages and think, wow, the Lord Jesus was just like a lion in that passage? Or do we tend to see how Jesus is, is often and not incorrectly pictured during his uh, sojourn here on earth, gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Didn't see a lion. Is that a, a false and misleading description? The lion of the tribe of Judah somehow has overcome? Well, what's he overcome? Who's he overcome? How has he become worthy to open up this book and to pursue the purposes of God and to bring justice down upon his enemies? Well, John tells us in the next couple of verses in Revelation 5. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's told, look, the lion. And he turns around. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Behold the lion. And I looked and saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. That's where he overcame. On the cross. By being the Lamb of God. That is where he became worthy. To be the lion. To be the one who would carry forward the purposes of God. And who would bring justice and vengeance on all his enemies. He had to be the Lamb before he could be the lion. And Paul tells us in Colossians 2 that what he did upon the cross was actually to disarm and to defeat and to make a public spectacle of the rulers and the authorities in darkness having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through, and I know it says up there, him, I think literally it's it, and it could just as easily, and I think maybe better, uh, said, having triumphed over them through the cross. That's where he overcame. That's where he was victorious and uh, became worthy to be known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, how does it work? Well, you know this, but let's just review it quickly. Satan deceives Adam and Eve. Has God said you're going to die? Well, they tell him, I think, God says we're going to die if we eat from that tree. You're not going to die. God's just worried that if you do eat it, you'll be like him. And so they eat, they're tricked, they're deceived, and they do die. They're immediately put out of the presence of God, dying spiritually, and uh, their bodies begin that process towards physical death as well. They gave themselves over. They became slaves to sin. And because they were slaves to sin, and because the wages of sin is death, they would die. And every descendant of theirs would die. Well, now think about this for a moment. What, what, what does man represent in the creation of God? Let us make man in our own image. The pinnacle 
of his creative activity was man. There were Adam and Eve bearing fully the image of God. And Satan comes in and he takes the image of God and he drags it down into the dirt. We were talking on Wednesday night about how God is very concerned about his name. His name is, is his character. It's all wrapped up when you see the name in Scripture. It means everything about God, all bundled up. His name is his character, is his being. How do you think it is when it's his image that has been defaced? We feel badly enough when somebody comes and tags the building here. What about these creatures who so wonderfully were made in the likeness of God and have now been defaced? Can you imagine how Satan laughed over that? Imagine how much wicked pleasure it gave him. He now had them. They were his children. Slaves to sin. Slaves, therefore, to death. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why he had to live the life that, that we couldn't live. So that he could give us righteousness that's why he had to die to take away our sins because having done those two things Jesus breaks the chains of our captivity to Satan you see how that works Satan doesn't have any hold on the children of God any longer because he had his hold based on the fact that our sin committed against the law of God would consign us to death and damnation. And now God looks at us, and as far as he's concerned, we've kept the law. Our account is cancelled. And the sins we had already committed, those are gone. He doesn't see those. Because Christ on the cross took them away. So Satan has no hold over us. Therefore, as, as Christ was saying, we no longer deserve to die. In Christ, we actually deserve to live. Only in him. Jesus came and bound the strong man, Satan. And he plundered his possessions. And he set the captives free. And he is restoring God's honor, restoring the image of God in the pinnacle of his work of creation. Triumphing over Satan. Making a public spectacle of them by showing how puny he is compared with an infinite and almighty God and breaking out the captives and making them slaves to righteousness and his own children and no longer children of Satan. So having done that on the cross, then Jesus is buried, then he rises from the dead to show that he has paid the debt, that it is cancelled, because he could never have risen unless he fully paid the debt, that the sin that he bore was why he died. He can't rise unless he pays for it all. It'll keep him dead. But he rises. And then he ascends into glory, sits at God's right hand, is, an, is a crowned king, and he rules. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, he must rule. He must continue to reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The lamb who was slain in order to be savior has become the lion who reigns as king and as judge, goes to the cross and is rewarded with a crown. And he is worthy to carry out the purposes of God and to bring justice to all of his enemies. 
to pour out wrath and retribution on them. So, believer, Christ your King is victorious. He has won. He has defeated the enemies of God. You've been set free from bondage to sin and Satan. You were dead because of sin. He has made you alive. And nobody can get in the way. Satan couldn't stop this from happening. Nobody can. He will carry his purposes forward. Those of us going through spiritual warfare at the moment, make sure you get a hold of this. The lion of the tribe of Judah is your victorious king. He rules over all. He will carry forward the purposes of God. He will deliver you also. He will draw near to you in these difficult times. But let's move on and look lastly at Jesus as the vengeful king because he's opening the seals and each seal spells and I know there are different interpretations about when the judgment falls, but the seals spell judgment. And it's Christ who's opening the seals. And Christ is pictured for us uh, in ways that we don't, don't often hear about in Scripture. As a vengeful king. As a judge with great anger and wrath. And this is where we, we ask the question, is Jesus safe? Is a lion safe? Is the one found worthy to execute judgment on the enemies of God safe? Isaiah 63 and the first six verses. This is Jesus, but in a way that we don't often think of him. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Bozrah? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red, and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger, and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I looked, and there was no one to help, and I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath. And I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. If you've ever uh, had red grape stains on your clothes, you'll know those can be very difficult to remove. And this is back in the days when you would make the wine by treading on the red grapes in a wine press and there would be a lot of splashing Inevitably, and here is this one with his garments spread. But, and that's Christ. And we can turn to Revelation 19 uh, to confirm that because it's even clearer here. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. That's Psalm 2 again, by the way. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. 
and on his robe and on his thighs he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, trampling down the enemies of God, crushing them as you would crush grapes in a press during the wine harvest. His appearance at this time is going to be unbearable to his enemies. Revelation 6. The kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Now, there is very good scholarship that shows that much of this imagery should be understood of what happened in AD 70. But it won't be any better than this on the last day when the Lord summons before him all his creatures all men and women, boys and girls, uh, for judgment. Won't be any better than this. He will still be awesome, terrifying in his appearance. Imagine the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah on that day. His wrath is terrifying. We read that in Psalm 2. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying effectively, you may think you can shake off the chains, if they are such, uh, that my king would put upon you. You may think you can be free. But as for me, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So let me ask you this morning, in the words that we were just reading in Revelation, who is able to stand when this Jesus appears, this lion, strong, courageous, fearless, wrathful, terrifying, when he appears bent on justice bent on treading down all those who have have turned their backs upon God, all of those who have spat in his face. Will you stand? Will you be able to stand? The only way is to fall upon this stone that the builders rejected and plead with him for mercy before he falls on you and crushes you into dust. And in a never-ending death, your blood will flow from the wine presses of, of God's wrath. And just as the coming of the Lion of the tribe of Judah was a promise and God has done it, this is a promise too. The enemies of God will be destroyed. They will feel the fierce anger and fury of the God whom they have rejected. Jesus is not safe. On that day, that will become very clear. You can't put him in a cage. You can't hire some kind of a lion tamer For the lion of the tribe of Judah. You need to seek him for mercy. And for forgiveness. And you need to take refuge in him. That's the advice at the end of Psalm 2. Show discernment, kings. It's not just kings who had to show discernment. Uh, Kings and the judges here are being told... Because of the king and the judge who's coming, they'd better watch out. 
Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son. Why? That he not become angry. You don't... You'll know that I'm reminded of the movie The Hulk, where one of the catch lines before he becomes green and hideous and ugly is, you won't like me when I'm angry. The Lord Jesus Christ, when his anger is aroused is a lion. He is all-powerful. He is bent on vengeance. He will destroy the enemies of God and there is no one who will be able to stand in his way and certainly no one who will be able to say that's not fair because it will be absolutely fair and everyone will know it in their hearts. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. If you were to die in a car crash on the way from here to your homes after church today, and you hadn't made your peace with the lion of the tribe of Judah, then his wrath would be kindled against you. Well, it's kindled already you would get to the point of no return. You would get to a point where it couldn't be remedied, where there was no possible escape, where you would be taken down into and bound and reserved for the day of judgment with no even remote possibility that your fate could be overturned. No appeals. You've had your chance. You've had many chances. And you have turned your back on each and every occasion, and now it's too late. His wrath may soon be kindled, but how blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's the only sensible thing to do. I said earlier on how we're not in our right minds until we come to know Christ. It ought to be obvious. I know for those of you here this morning who don't know Christ, it's not clear that somehow it's a foolish thing to keep putting the, the Lord Jesus Christ at arm's length knowing that one day he's going to come in judgment. You can't see how foolish that is. You can't see how foolish it is to keep pushing it off maybe next week, maybe the week after. Tempting the wrath of God. All the time, all you have in your heart for him is contempt. And you can't see that the only sensible thing you can do, the only reasonable thing you can do, is to come and fall before him and ask for his forgiveness and turn from your sin and trust him to save you. Nothing else makes any sense. You've got no answer. You can't neutralize the lion of the tribe of Judah. He will come. And he will judge. And he will bring forward the purposes of God and execute justice on all those who remain obstinately the enemies of God. So Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The king of kings and the lord of lords. To be that... He had first to be the Lamb. He has absolute power. Believer, behold your King. Unbeliever, don't live with your head in the sand. As though these things are not true. You know they are in your heart. And don't believe all those voices in you and around you that keep trying to stop you from falling on the Lord Jesus Christ and seeking mercy from him. Let's spend a few moments in prayer together.